going to take our second part of this series that we started last month with um, the keeping our eyes on Jesus for the win. And today we're talking about, in that second sermon, the making of a champion. And um, before we get started, let's just open in prayer, okay? Let's present this to the Lord. Where we are right now. Father God, we come into your presence, Lord, with thanksgiving in our heart. Lord, we thank you that we can come into this building, this place, and be in your presence. A holy God who knows us, who understands us, who loves us. Thank you, Father, for your unfailing love. You are mighty. Thank you for bringing every one of us here safely. Lord, we pray for those who couldn't get here for whatever reason. And Lord, we lift up to you those who come here today, Lord, with a burdened heart, a heavy heart. And Lord, we ask that you would just speak to us through your word this morning. Lord. Thank you for this word that you've given us to encourage us, to build us up, Father. And we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would stand, please, as I read um, Romans chapter, actually it's part of chapter 8, but we're going to start because it starts in Romans chapter 7, verse 21. And uh, it says, I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life? that is dominated by sin and death. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the body we sinners have. And in that day, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sin. He did this so that the just requirement of the law could be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of the sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by the sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And 
Christ lives within you, even though your body will die because of sin. The Spirit gives us life because you have been made white with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what the sinful nature urges you to do. You may be seated. <clears throat> like I said, today's message is called The Making of a Champion. And the subtitle is What Dominates Your Thoughts? What Dominates Your Thoughts? The Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul had never been to Rome. Although he was going to go to Rome, and he's writing this letter, and in Romans chapter 1, verse 10, it tells us why he's writing this letter. He's writing this letter to encourage the believers so that when he gets there, he can encourage them, and he can be encouraged by them. Okay? But here he talks on a, very, a topic that we don't hear a whole lot about which we do need to hear about. But you know what? This topic is something that he himself struggled with. He says in the very, in verse 21, he said, I want you to understand this principle. What is the principle? You see, the Apostle Paul, he had been preaching the gospel for 21 years. Of those 21 years, he spent 10 <clears throat> going through the regions of, a, of Asia and Asia Minor, and he would plant churches. And now he's finding himself, he's done all that he can do in the area that God's called him to do. And so God gave him a vision now to go to Rome and he wants to go to Rome to preach the good news. But see, there were believers in Rome, even though he had never, there was a church in Rome, even though he had never been there. Where did these believers come from? Well, we find in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, in verse 10, it tells us that on the day of Pentecost, there were Romans, people from Rome, there at the day of Pentecost. That's where this church came from, believers. And so what Paul is writing to them to encourage them and to let them know that he's coming to Rome. He's coming to Rome to preach the gospel there to Roman officials. Amen. But he's not, you know, uh, God has told him, hey, you're going to prepare because there's going to be some suffering along the way, and there was. But Paul's ultimate goal was he was going to go to Rome to preach and preach the gospel, and then he was moving on to Spain. But here he gives us a principle. It's a truth. You can take it to the bank. And I think it's a struggle that not only he himself dealt with and struggled with, but guess what? We struggle with it too. And it's called our sinful nature. Now the first part, the principle here, is that a champion, the making of a champion, a champion knows what the battle, he knows that the battle is real. All right, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 18 says this. But I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then, what? Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. 
The Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free, big word, to carry out your good intentions. See, Paul is saying here, he struggles with this. He wants to do right. But his sinful nature gets in the way. How many of us struggle every day with our sinful nature? You know? Every day we wake up, you know, we our feet hit the floor. We have decisions that we have to make. And we those decisions are based on whether we're walking or living in the spirit or we're walking or living in our sinful nature. And guess what? Our sinful nature has no desire to please God. To please God. So every one of us face this battle. So how do we how do we face this battle? You know, like I said, the champion realizes he's in the battle. We have to realize that every day we wake up and our feet hits that floor, that we're facing a battle. We're facing a battle. We belong to God, it says. We belong to Christ. Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17, says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like wise, make the most of every opportunity when? In these evil days. In these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. He has a plan for our life. I don't care if you're 99 or you're 1. God's purpose, he has a purpose and a plan for you and me. Okay, if we choose to follow that plan, there are blessings. I was reading this morning in my in First Kings about King Solomon, who had a lot of wives and concubines. Okay? And it said all of his wives from different countries, and God had told him not to marry women from other nations. Why? Because those women worship other gods, and it would turn against him. God told him that. But yet he disobeyed God and he married these women who brought their gods with them. And he began to worship their gods. And then God said, okay, that's it. You're done. You know, I'm going to do what I promised to do. I promised to leave someone on the throne from King David's dynasty. And he did. But your kingdom is over. Because it's disobedience. So we, in, in, in this verse here, it says we have to be careful how we live. God has plans, and in those plans are wisdom. God has plans and a purpose for our life. But I'm going to tell you a story. I guess it was about 10 years ago, God called us to community outreach ministries. We didn't know how this was going to come about. We had no money, but we went ahead and forward with it by faith. And we said, God, we don't have the money to start this. God provided everything we needed to start that first week. It was over $1,600 that we needed to start this up. And it came by the end of the week from the least likely source, okay? But because God believed in us and God, this was something God wanted to happen. But see, along the way, Ken got in the way. 
you know, and I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that and stuff instead of following God's plan. Okay? And see, God cares about the homeless people that we minister to. And so I had to learn that I had to get out of what God wanted to do and just follow him. Okay? And just follow him. Number two, a champion knows what to avoid. Romans 8, verses 5 and 6. You know, as an athlete, as a champion, marathon runner, a runner knows what to avoid. He knows the things to avoid to keep him healthy. The foods that he needs to eat. He knows his stretching is an important part of his life. He knows relaxing is an important part of his journey. Romans 8 verses 5 and 6 says this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature do what? Think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So, letting your sinful nature control the way you your, control your mind leads to what? Death. Separation. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. This world will never give you peace. It can't. The only person who can give you peace is Jesus Christ. Amen. In our culture, in our world that we live in, there is so much anxiety. People are looking for truth. But the only person who can give life and peace. I have... Um, Four brothers. Okay, I'm in the middle. I have two older and two uh, younger. The oldest brother, he's passed away. Um, but my other brothers think life is this. Every time they get together, life is a party. It involves drinking. You know, and to, to relax. You know, they don't know what life is about. Life is about living in the presence of a holy God. You know, I've been high and I've been drunk. Okay? And I can tell you this. Being high on the Holy Spirit is a lot better than being high or drunk. Because my and the Holy Spirit gives you a gives you joy. Amen? John, 1 John verses 4 and 5 says this. This is good news. Dear friends, do not believe, oh, I'm sorry, it's a long, it's 1 John 4, 4 and 5, and it says this, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. Why? Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit that lives in this world. Amen. Those people speak from the world's point of view and the world listens to them. The world's spirit is weak. You see, uh, you've heard the phrase, well, uh, I'm going to go to hell with everybody else. You don't know what that means. You don't know what that term means. You know, it's easy to follow everything the world is doing. But it really takes a person who is strong to stand and resist those things. <clears throat> but it says here, that the Holy Spirit lives in us. We have the power within us, the Spirit of God, to say no and to say it with power. Amen. 
Why? Because we are the children of the living God. Amen? A champion knows what the wind looks like. A champion does whatever. He does every day what he does with one thing in goal. He's looking <coughs> for that wind. He gets up. He trains. He doesn't let anything distract him. He does whatever he has to do because he knows wind looks like. He can envision crossing that finish line. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 through 3 says this. Dear brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I could not talk to you as though you were spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk and not solid food. Why? Because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. You know what? God wants you where you are. See, some of you need that milk. You know, and milk is not a bad thing. Because infants grow, that's where they get their nutrition, and that's how they grow. The point is, you need to be growing. And how do you grow? You have to feed. You have to feed on something. Are you feeding on what the world has to offer? Are you feeding on what God has to offer? If it's milk you need, then drink it. If you can handle steak, imagine this. Given an infant who needs milk and trying to give him steak and get him to eat it. It's not going to happen. So we need to acknowledge where we are. If it's milk, then hey, I know the only way I'm going to grow is I can't stand here on Sunday morning and just hear Pastor Mark preach and then go home and say, well, I'm fed for the month or fed for the week. It's not going to happen. You need to be fed every day. And sometimes it's three or four times a day. I need it in everything I do. And finally, in Galatians 5, 24 and 25, it says, those who belong to Christ. Those who belong to Christ. Do you know Christ? Do you belong to him? There is a term in physics called the law of motion. When motion is put in and it's working, guess what it does? It creates something called friction. So are you creating, are you in motion? Are you creating friction? But it says, those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of the sinful nature to the cross. To the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, it says, let us follow the Spirit's leading in everything we do. In our finances, in our careers, in retirement. See, even though we're retired, we may go into Hardy's and get our biscuit every morning. I remember Oren Bryant. I don't know if anybody here remembers Oren, Susie May, but Oren Bryant used to go up here to Hardy's every morning and get biscuits. And his wife, Sybil, was like this trainer. You know, uh, she was fit, you know, as a king, you know what I mean? And uh, 
should always get on the board about that. Well, or I'm going to go up there. But being retired, going to Hardy's, there are people there that are retired too who need to see the light. Amen. So at the beginning, I ask, what dominates your thoughts? What dominates your thoughts? Is it pleasing to God? Does it want to please God? You know, we're all thinking. If you're not thinking, you're brain dead. Right? So at the encounters years ago at Glad Tides, um, one of the sessions that we did, we had an opportunity where you could come and take a nail and it represented garbage, represented stuff that dominated us, stuff that unforgiveness, whatever. And you may be here this morning and you may be suffering from sickness, a disease. Only you and God knows what that is. But God wants to give you an opportunity this morning to take a nail Whatever that is that dominates your thoughts. And guess what? Nail it to the cross. Because the verse says that you take that stuff and nail it. That crud. And nail it to the cross. To whose cross? Jesus' cross. And crucify it there. So whatever gets nailed here stays there. It did. Frees you to live on. To move on. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this important part of the word. How we battle and struggle with these two um, these two forces that want to control us. And so, Lord, whatever we nail to this cross, may we begin to live free from that garbage, from what controls us, what, what dominates us. So, Lord, we want to take this opportunity. Thank you. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to stand here because I'm going to pray with you if you want me to pray with you.